and it stands for adenosine triphosphate. This is the molecule of ATP. Now what happens with ATP is you've got a very strong bond here, and what it does is it chops very high energy, so when it chops this bond, it releases lots of energy. And that's the energy currency of the body. It's so important uh, that in fact your body would probably be making about half its own weight in ATP every day and then consuming it. And cyanide works by stopping ATP being produced and it causes death in 30 seconds. So it gives you an idea of how vital ATP is for life, the energy currency of the body. But now we know, um, thanks to research done only in 1997, that the ATP is, mo is made by this tiny molecular motor. This is the world's tiniest motor and the discovery was regarded as so important that the, they won the Nobel Prize. That was only about five years ago that they won this. And it's so complicated, I can't even draw it for you properly in, in this thing. This is only a, a schematic. See, each of these uh, ones here, each of these ones here has about 500 subunits and arranged in a very precise way. And it's spinning about 10,000 revs per minute. So you listen carefully, you might hear it whirring. Because they're in each of your cells. But here's an example of it in very, very slow motion. This is the profile view. Of course, this is going about 10,000 revs per minute, though. And here's a top view of it. And every rotation, it produces three ATP molecules. But this molecule is vital for life, and yet it, it's, it's a, an incredibly complicated motor. You couldn't have life unless you had this motor to produce the energy currency. So it looks like this, life, this motor must have been there right from the beginning. And I'd say that because uh, this motor is so much better, so much tinier, more efficient than any motor we can design, I'd say the design of this motor is far more intelligent than any motor design we have today too. Some uh, cells, this is a simple cell, has a, another type of motor. Uh, this is probably not essential for life, but it's still very interesting to see how complex even a so-called simple cell is. The bacterium, a germ, has the, a, a real electrical rotary motor here. This is a rotary motor. I'll, I'll actually ha be able to have it animated for you. And what this motor is doing is it's making a wave in this whip-like cord called a flagellum. This is a flagellum here, and by the whip-like movement that the motor generates, the germ can propel itself through the liquid it's in. So it's amazingly complex uh, things. Even in a simple cell, you look at it in more detail, you find there's incredible layers of complexity there. So how is all this made, though? Because if God finished creating on day six, he's no longer doing any direct creation, apart from a new believer is a new creation in Christ. But more, by and large, what God is doing is sustaining his creation. That's what, in fact, Jesus is doing. Uh, Colossians 1.15 and Hebrews 1.3, Jesus is the one who hold, upholds the creation by the word of his power. So what God is doing now is sustaining his creation. And one way he's done that is he's programmed the instructions for all these things on um, an information molecule called DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And this is actually a real messenger molecule. It's actually storing information on, uh, on, the, uh, on the sequence of the chemical letters. Each of these uh, rungs here is, is a chemical letter. And in each of our cells, there's three billion uh, of these chemical letters in each of our cells. Uh, the simplest living thing has almost 600,000 of them. And here's a, a nice colorful diagram of, uh, of the famous double helix structure. It was only discovered 50 years ago. Uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded to the discoverers, uh, Watson, Crick, and Wilkins. And the, the other thing about DNA is it can reproduce itself because you've got these little letters. Uh, you've got four types of letters in DNA. Um, one letter is called A for adenine, and it always bonds with T for thymine. Uh, cytosine always bonds with, uh, with guanine. And what happens is that this thing will get zipped in the middle there, and see a cytosine will always bond with another guanine. This uh, thymine will always bond with an adenine. So you've got a way of transmitting the information to the next generation. So you imagine you unzip 
this in the middle, and each of the, the chains gets a, a, a mirror image of it. This all the photographic negative, as it were. There's an exact photographic negative of each of the strands, and that's how the information we pass on uh, from generation to generation. So not only does DNA enable the information to be passed on, but it, it, it's information that codes for something. In fact, the information in each of our cells is the equivalent of about 100,000 a a books of information. These are large volumes of information. That's a lot of information. So it's so very lucky that our <coughs> cells aren't using paper and ink to store the information. Now, to explain a bit about that information, it's nothing to do with the material it's on because, see, I've got information in a book and here the information is in the form of paper and ink. But the information is not the paper and ink, it's the way the paper and ink is arranged. If I read the book to you, the information would be the same, but it's in the form of patterns of sound waves. Uh, when I, I wrote it on my computer, uh, the information was in a pattern of um, on-off pattern, magnetic patterns on a, on a metallic disc. Uh, if it's uh, sent by email, then the information is a, is a form of electrical impulses. So same information, different ways of transmitting it. And in, in the DNA, the information is stored in the form of chemical letters. Now, it is possible uh, in, um, to write out the information of your DNA in paper and ink form. That's what the Human Genome Project was all, all about. But we can do it the other way around. We can work out <clears throat> if we had a pinhead of DNA, in theory, we could write the information of these books on DNA. But it turns out a pinhead, two millimeters in diameter, a spherical pinhead, would be the equivalent of a pile of paperback books reaching from here to the sun, just about, or 500 times from here to the moon. That's paperback books I could saw on just one pinhead of DNA. Or to put it another way, see a 1600 kilometer high pile of CD, you know, a CD can, uh, can store the entire set of the, the Encyclopedia Britannica, but a 1600 kilometer high pile of CDs would be required to store what could be stored in just a single pinhead of DNA. The other way of putting it is a 40 gigabyte hard drive. It's not a bad hard drive, I've been told, but in fact, a pinhead of DNA is, is 100 million times better. So you think our multi gigabyte hard drive is something special. Well, God's information technology just leaves it in the, in the dust. A DNA by itself would just be like a blank hard drive. There's nothing there. There's no programs on it. So to, to program something, you need a programmer. So for DNA, you have to...